Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I was just realizing as you were reading that, thank you very much for the introduction, Scott. I was just realizing that all of the examples of tools he gave, I left out of this presentation. But they're all applicable anyway. I have examples for all of them. Uh, I just I came up with a bunch of other proof of concepts. Um, so I didn't use Zap or Jenkins or SonarCube. Uh, but I'll talk a little about them anyway. Um, and I'm happy to talk about them after the, after the talk uh, with any of you if you're interested too, or if you have questions. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, Obligatory slide, right? I'm a principal consultant at Aspect Security. I lead our automation and integration services, which is very much aligned with this talk, which is very much aligned with this conference. It's how do you do application security effectively and efficiently in a scalable way, uh, primarily through the use of automation uh, where applicable. Um, and I think an important thing here is that I've, I've never been a developer. I was never in a developer role. Um, and I think that's important because a lot of what we're going to be talking about here is writing tools, customizing tools, and I never had a job where, th where that was my job, right? Um, so I don't know how many of you are developers or were developers? A lot of you. Okay. How many of you were never developers? It's the inverse of that question. All right. Just a few of you. So most of you are probably much better at this than I am and further along. And one of the key takeaways that I wanted you to have here is that don't be intimidated to experiment and write your own tools or your own extensions for existing tools because it's much easier than it seems, even for someone who's not a developer uh, who just loves to sort of tinker and, and play and learn new technologies. Um, so uh, at work and outside of work, I'm, I'm very interested in process efficiency. So de uh, sec plus dev plus ops in whatever order you combine them, uh, I'm very interested in that, um, doing it effectively and learning cool tools. So. Um, I'm really bad at time management with slides, so I may be un under time, but more likely I'll be way over time, so we might not get to everything. Um, if that's the case, it's okay. Um, my slides will be on the internet. I usually put them on SlideShare in the next day or so, um, so you're welcome to grab them there, um, or I can provide them to you in some other format if you'd like. Um, so getting into it, the application security landscape from a tools perspective now is pretty congested. There are a lot of different tools available, um, and they all serve sort of different functions. So uh, show of hands here, who uses at least one of these tools or, or vendors? It's pretty much everyone. Who uses at least two of these tools or vendors? Right? Yeah, it's also pretty much everyone. And I think that's very telling, right? Because all of these tools are sold as silver bullets for solving all of your security problems, and none of them do that really effectively. Otherwise, you would only need one of them. Um, so, uh, none of them are silver bullets. Um, most of them provide some way to see the data that they gather, uh, or they are a method to see the data, right? If they are a dashboarding tool, um, a way to visualize the data. Um, but most of them don't provide you a good way to interact with data that they haven't collected on their own, right? So they're, they're usually not very good at taking in data from third party sources, whether open source or commercial tools outside of their own brand. Um, and that's really challenging because then you end up with you know, five different dashboards. Um, and you're supposed to log into all of them to get the data out, and it's in different formats, and that's a problem. So these are the types of challenges we're going to talk about today um, as we get into it. So digging a little deeper on the problem, I have uh, four general roles that we're going to talk about uh, with five, five overall problems. Because um, I know LastCon is a pretty diverse audience. Usually there are, there are pen testers, there are security architects, uh, there may be some managers or, or higher, higher level people in the organization on the business side. Um, and then, you know, problems for everyone. So um, we're going we're to walk through these sort of one by one. So for, for manual pen testers, um, and that's how I started my career, and I, I don't do it a whole lot anymore, but when I do, I don't want to spend time trying to find things that a tool can find. Uh, I find it just very wasteful and mind-numbing to look at HTTP headers to figure out if there's a secure flag or an HTTP only flag because a tool can easily detect that type of thing. And I think that tools should be detecting all of these things and probably way more. This was just a quick list, right? So if you're a uh, pen tester and you're looking for any of these things uh, or anything else that's not on this list that you think could be detected automatically, you should be writing a tool to do it. Um, and you should be providing that tool to everyone else on your team. So that everyone, right, provides some more um, consistency across findings across your team, as well as reducing the amount of time that you are spending looking for easy things so that you can dig into deeper issues 
right? Finding the, the real access control issues that the tools are not going to be able to find, or the five-step cross-site scripting uh, vulnerabilities that the tools aren't going to find. Um, the much more interesting things. Um, so just to quickly look at some of these, right? Like if you have a cross-domain policy within your organization, you say, my application should not be framed by you know, evil.com, right? Any, organ any domain outside of my business's domain, you should have a rule in Burp or Zap or you know, whatever uh, dynamic application security testing tools you're using that will automatically find that. You shouldn't be looking at the CSP policy or the, the, you know, the framing policy in your headers. Um, is the page accessible over HTTP when it should only be HTTPS? That's a, yeah, it, it doubles the, uh, the requests, right, that the tool's going to send, but that's, that's no overhead for you. So you should have your tools automatically in the background just sending a request to every HTTP page that you look for an HTTPS page for. Um, I'm going to skip over the, the metadata for now because that's the, the next slide we're going to talk about that some more. Like verbose error handling, right, or verbose error messages. If you, if you see ORA dash number, 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 that's an Oracle error, almost certainly. So, and you may miss it because very often that may come back in like an Ajax response. Um, so it may not be viewable on the page, but the, your, your tools, your proxy tools, are still going to be looking at all of that content so they can detect those types of things really easily. Um, so again, just some examples to keep in mind. So um, feel free also, I, I prefer these to be interactive, although they usually aren't. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them midstream. We don't have to wait till the end. Happy to have a discussion during this. Um, so this is all about the uh, XF data embedded in images. So who here is familiar with XF data? OK. Who here is familiar with this John McAfee story? A couple, right? So this was, this was about four years ago. Uh, John McAfee, who is uh, the founder of McAfee, uh, the antivirus software, uh, he was a person of interest in Belize for something that happened in his neighborhood. I think there was a shooting with his neighbor or something. He was a person of interest. Um, and so the police wanted to talk to him. He did not want to talk to the police. And so he went on the run. He went uh, looking. He went hiding. Um, and so no one could find him. Um, but he did invite some journalists to come and interview him about what was going on. So uh, this one journalist from uh, Vice Media went and interviewed him and took a picture with him. Uh, Vice then took that picture and posted it on their Twitter feed and their, the, the front page of their website. Um, and some, I meant to look up the name of the user so I could give them credit, but some Twitter user uh, saw the picture, downloaded it, and checked the metadata in the picture. And what it contained, and you can't see it here, but I'll show you again on the next slide, uh, is the exact coordinates that John McAfee was standing at in the world uh, when the picture was taken. And so now the entire world suddenly knew where John McAfee was. And within a day, he was turning himself over to the police because you can't, you can't get away from that. Right? So this is not an issue, having this type of issue. Uh, so, so the reason that this information was embedded in the picture was not because the, uh, the reporter put it there, but because the reporter took his, this picture with his, with his iPhone. Right? And the iPhone 4, in this case, automatically embeds uh, information about uh, the situation where the picture is taken. So it embeds, this is a, this is a pointer, I think, right? So it embeds the, the actual phone. So this, that says Apple iPhone 4S, shows the lens type, the exposure, whether or not the flash was used, and then those are the coordinates, right? If you have location services on, that may be in all of your pictures that are on your phone. And so when you share those pictures, that information may or may not be available to uh, whoever's looking at them. So just something to keep in mind. This is not something that is an issue for many clients, uh, many of our clients, right? We, most of our clients are in the financial sector. They don't have a lot of like file sharing. Um, so it's not really an issue. But we did have one client where they were like, we, it's, it's sort of like a social media site, like a, a little social media site within their network. Um, and people are going to be uploading pictures. We don't want uh, everyone to be able to get information like this out of the pictures that our users are uploading. So one of our engineers, his name is Jay Ball, um, wrote a tool. Uh, an extension um, for Burp and an extension for Zap that will just automatically detect this. So you can see, I'm sorry, it's, I can tell that it's like tiny, um, even close up, uh, or blurry at least. But this, these are coordinates in the world, right? And so all you have to do is browse through, you do your normal pen testing, and when you come across an image, uh, Burp or Zap will check the metadata on that image. Uh, for this EXIF data. And if it finds it, it calls it out passive scanner. We'll, we'll call it out as a vulnerability. Um, so this is just like a simple, it's like a, 
um, standard of living increase. No, that's not right, right? But like, uh, right? It makes your life just a little bit easier, a little bit better, provides more value to our clients because now we can just provide this to all of our clients and they can decide how they risk rate this as an issue. For some, it may be an issue. For others, it may not. Um, but this is just an example, right? Something that your tool can do that you don't have to do uh, because it's mind numbing to go through it. So another example here, um, if you're doing a code review, uh, this is a pattern that we often see, right, where you have uh, a post request. Uh, I, I submit a form via a post request, and the developer takes, takes that content and just submits it immediately to, to do get, and all the actual business logic is, is in the do get method. Uh, this is a security issue because if I am submitting my login credentials, right, uh, this allows me to also submit them via get. Um, and so I, as a user, you, you as a developer may set up the form to submit the credentials via post, but I, as an attacker, now have a new attack vector where I can get you to submit the credentials via get, and uh, if I can sniff your traffic somehow, I may be able to get them. Right? So uh, you, can, you can evaluate the risk, but generally it's not a good practice to do this. Um, and so I don't want to look for this manually, though, because this is like a real obvious pattern. Um, so what I did was I wrote a PMD rule. How many people are familiar with PMD? Just a few. And that's not really surprising because PMD is not really a security tool. It's really a functional testing tool. Can anyone read that? No? It's just really blurry. I got to work on this. I'm sorry. So what it says is that this is from their website. PM PMD is a source code analyzer. It finds common programming flaws like unused variables, empty catch blocks, unnecessary object creation, and so forth. Um, so nothing, nothing to do with security in there. This is like code quality issues. The benefit of writing a PMD rule is that your developers may already be using this. Right? They may be using this in their development environment that may be integrated into their CI environment already. So you can look for tools that your developers are already using that may not be security tools and get some security benefit out of them by writing a rule to detect security relevant things. So this is the rule I wrote. That's somewhat legible, but I, I'm going to just open it up because that's a whole lot bigger. So this is dope. Did I just get a message or was that someone else? So this is the rule. Um, and you can see it's, it's pretty small, right? We have a whole bunch of imports here. We're importing the, the PMD libraries. Um, but the rule itself is small. And so all we do here is we check. I'm going to do this with the mouse. So uh, we're going to look at every, every method declaration. So I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with parse trees. Um, one of the um, LangSec talks yesterday really covered uh, parse trees really well, if you were part of that. Um, but if not, right, PMD basically creates an abstract syntax tree for all of your source code. Um, and it looks at one file at a time. So it will take one class file and create an abstract syntax tree for it, where it will say, all right, we have a method declaration here uh, at the top of the tree. And then here is the name of the method. And then under that is each node is the, the arguments for that method. Does that make any sense? Or is that really unclear? Yeah. So it basically creates a tree structure for all of your code so that it can understand it. And then it goes through and it looks for patterns in that uh, tree, uh, syntax tree, um, and, and applies rules to it. So here. We're going to look for any method declaration. Essentially, that's what this is saying within the abstract syntax tree. We're going to look at every method declaration that, that PMD comes across. And then we're going to say, hey, is the, for this node, which is the method declaration, is it do get? If the method is do get or the method is, sorry, if it's not do get or it's not do post, then we're going to return out of this because we don't, we don't want to look at that. If it is do get or do post, we're going to keep going. And we're going to say, hey, did, does this method call another method called do post or do get. And if it does, then we're going to use this X path, which I know is long, um, but it's really not complicated. How many people are familiar with X path? Uh, that's more than I thought. That's great. So X path is awesome, in my opinion. I think it's really great for parsing XML. It's really, really easy to learn. It's very powerful. You could do a whole lot with it. Um, and so a few of these examples that I'll use today use X path, because a lot of times the output files uh, from our tools is XML. Um, and that's, it's easy to parse with, with XPath. So, uh, so we use this XPath, and we, we look for this particular structure. Um, 
and there's a, there's a tool called the PMD rule designer. And so when you're creating this rule, you import a, a class file into it, and it, you'll see the whole tree structure. And so that's how, that's how I came up with this. This isn't just out, you know, off the top of my head. Um, I use the rule designer to see what the tree looks like and then just follow it visually. Um, so we're going to look uh, for this method, uh, invocation for do get or do post. And then we're going to look for the arguments passed to it. And in this case, we're just looking for the names. So we're not doing like type checking. We're not making sure that it's the right uh, HTTP uh, request and response uh, objects. Um, but again, for proof of concept, I feel like this is pretty good. Um, and we check, we make sure, hey, did we have parameters that we found? And if so, did the first one, was it called request? And was the second one called response? And if that's true, we're going to add a violation. And that's it. So I, hopefully you get the point that this is really not very complex. Um, it's really pretty simple. It's just saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to follow this tree, then we're going to use XPath to, to look a little deeper, and we're going to look for certain information in the tree. But it's, it's pretty short. It took me about 15, 20 minutes to write it. Uh, I've written a couple PMD rules before, but I'm certainly not an expert. Um, so the barrier to entry is not, not too high. Um, so now when we run this rule, you get output like this. So I created two files that I considered vulnerable to this rule, right? So I had one file called get equals post, where I have a, a get method that just invokes post. And I have another file called post equals get, where I have a post method that just invokes get. And I ran PMD on it. And we can see the output is the file names, the line numbers, and then the information about the rule that I wrote, right, to say that it's vulnerable. Um, so this is HTML. That's one of the output formats of PMD. But if your developers are already running PMD, this will be in whatever format they're already consuming. Right? And this will be just alongside whatever other functional or code quality bugs that you're already detecting. Um, so this is what I call basically security for free. You can write it for a tool that developers are already using, add some security juice to it, and uh, it's free security. Any questions so far? No? All right. Um, so uh, any, any architects in here, security architects, people looking to, like, how do I do this? How do I integrate this tool into my CI, CD pipeline type stuff? Yeah? OK. So this is a really hard question. I think in general, there are a lot of different ways to integrate various tools into your CI, CD pipeline or to automate them in general. Um, and I know you can't read any of this. Um, but uh, you know, I wanted to make, it, make the point that there are, there are different ways to do this. So, um, of an anecdote. So we had a, a client about, it was about six years ago, they were using AppScan source and we decided to, it's a static analysis tool if you're not familiar, uh, we decided to integrate uh, AppScan source into their existing uh, CI builds and they use Jenkins, right? So uh, we wrote that batch file on the left, on the left side and we said, okay, we, we take this batch file and we stick it into Jenkins and so every time you build your application, we're also going to execute this batch file um, which will execute AppScan source on your code. Um, so we started out this process. It was working pretty well. Um, there were four variables at the top of the file that needed to be modified, right? Like the name of the project and uh, the location of the, the, the uh, files to be scanned, things like that. Like very pretty basic information. Um, so this process was working pretty well. And then we stepped back. So one of one of the things that I, I like about my role um, is that I, we try not to do too much like permanent staff logs. We try to train people to do it. So, um, uh, so the client had people who were going to take over this role. Um, and those people were security people, but they were not coders. Uh, they hadn't worked with Batch before. They really hadn't worked with any scripting languages before. Um, and so um, their job was to continue to onboard these applications. And as they went, um, all they had to do was update these four parameters at the top, these four variables at the top. Um, so it started off well, but after a few weeks, we started to notice some issues, some scans that were failing or coming back with weird results. And when we went and looked, uh, we saw that they were just not doing it properly, right? They, they were not updating the variables. Uh, they were not updated, like they would forget to update a variable, uh, right? And if we had a template, then maybe they were scanning the wrong application. Um, if they had copied and pasted from, from something else. Or, you know, they had fat fingered and added some character that, uh, you know, the batch uh, wasn't allowing and it would give some syntax error. And I don't know if you've ever worked with batch, but the, 
uh, error messages are not super clear, um, usually, especially if you're not familiar with it. Um, so it caused some problems. Or if, if they would accidentally mess with something further into the script, right? Like they would actually accidentally click somewhere and, and hit a character and the whole script would fail. So what we, de what we determined was that this, this particular audience was not a good audience to be handing a batch file and saying, hey, update these variables. So we decided to write a plugin uh, for Jenkins for them uh, to make it a whole lot easier. And it looked very similar to this. Um, so that plugin is owned by that client. Uh, we've since re rewritten it, basically. Uh, so this, what you see here, is an open source version of the plugin. All of the stuff that I'm showing you today is open source. It's all on GitHub, and I'll, I'll show you links later. Um, um, but that, uh, so that plugin is, is available. Um, and we wanted to make it super simple. So you can see at the top, you have a drop down. So on one other screen, you configure, hey, where's AppScan source installed? That'll be your administrators going to Jenkins and configure that. So all these people have to do is, is select the installation they want to use if you have multiple installations installed on the box. Um, say, uh, and basically, at the bottom, you point to the, the scan file. There's a couple other options, but they're generally not going to be used, at least by this team. Right? So it's, it's fairly foolproof, as long as they know the files that they want to scan. And we can have pretty simple error messages in here to describe when something's not right. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that the, the use case on the right, that these plugins are always the best case. Right? If you're going to be the one who's running these scripts and you're very familiar with it, then you may, you may want to stick with the, the option on the left and just write a, a batch script that you can maintain. There's less to maintain, less APIs to worry about, less of a learning curve generally than learning how to you know, interact with the full plugin interface. Um, but if you're going to roll it out to a bunch of developers or a bunch of build engineers or a bunch of other people um, who may not have the same context that you do, uh, you may want to consider writing a plugin because, again, it, it really isn't that hard. Um, so I can talk about that. So I, I, I wasn't planning to, but so AppScan source outputs a file called the, it's the extension is .ozasmt, um, but it's an, it's an assessment file. It's XML. So yes, so you can, you can parse that XML. Um, so we have another plugin. Um, I don't remember if it's like in a ready state on GitHub. It is on GitHub, uh, but it will take the output of this scan and push it to AppScan Enterprise, um, which is IBM's like central reporting console. Um, but one of the other things I was going to talk about later is that there are parsers for a lot of security tools already out on the internet. So like Threadfix from Denim Group, like if you go, Threadfix is open source and they've already written parsers for AppScan Source and Fortify and I think Checkmarks and a few other tools. Um, so you're, you're stealing my takeaway at the end, but that was one of them is don't, don't start from scratch because you should always start from an existing project. Feel free to you know, steal my code and then just modify it. You know, modify the UI, modify the functionality, but you have a base that works. Um, it makes it a whole lot easier than you know, downloading the, the base Maven archetype and trying to figure everything out from there. Um, and the same thing goes with parsers. Don't write your own parser unless it's not, it doesn't exist already. Um, the OWASP benchmark project is also open source and has some parsers uh, in there too. So I've, I've utilized both of those sources um, in the past. So even if you don't use the parser, you can, you can better understand the schema that you're trying to parse by seeing what they did. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, so consider your audience when, you're, when you do extend these tools. If it's beyond yourself, you may want to make the interface a little, a little more user friendly, a little more foolproof. So then custom dashboards. This is another one. Uh, custom dashboards and reporting I'm going to talk about after this. Um, but we hear this a lot, right? I have five tools and I have seven dashboards and none of them are showing me what I want to see, right? And that's because, in my opinion, that's because the vendors who produce these tools are focused on their core competency, which in, in many cases is finding vulnerabilities and, you know, storing them somewhere. And showing you those vulnerabilities is just a little less important to them because that's generally not part of a bake-off, right? And they can always say, hey, you can always export them to this other format and import it to this other tool, which is what I'm telling you to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I don't really think mo any of the dashboards that are out there are out of the box going to serve anyone's needs. Um, so I'm, I'm all about integrating and customizing um, for that. Um, so most of the dashboards are uh, bulky installations, right? Big servers. Um, they're not intuitive UIs, lacks of flexibility. And again, the, ability, the inability to import data from other tools 
um, including like your pen test results, right? Like why, why are your pen test and code review results in a different place than your static analysis results, which are in a different place than your dynamic analysis results? They, they should all be together, and that place should not be one giant spreadsheet, um, which is what everyone seems to do. So uh, here's one of my solutions. And this is where SonarCube comes in. This is where Jenkins comes in. And that's uh, on a future slide. I do talk about it a little bit. Um, but you can write your own dashboards, and it's really not that hard. So who, familiar is, uh, who here is familiar with the Elk stack? That's pretty good. OK. So Elk um, is uh, a set of tools from Elasticsearch. It's, um, first is Elasticsearch, which is a database. Logstash, which is able to parse various input if you teach it how, um, and, and push it to some other location. Um, and Kibana, which is a dashboard utility. It's a bit dashboarding tool, a visualization tool. Probably more. I may be oversimplifying. It's usually used for, um, as a sim, right, for like network monitoring. And that's actually how I got involved with it, is that I use uh, the Elk stack on my home network to monitor like network traffic and stuff like that. And then uh, it was actually just like last week, I was like, I wonder if I could use this for application security. Um, and so I started to think, what if we were to take all of my results from all of these different tools and put them into Elk? What could I figure out? So this is an experiment I'm just sort of starting. I think, I, I think there's some promise here, though. Um, I think we can take it further. So this is uh, from Logstash here. Um, this is the parser. This parses uh, burp output. Um, so this was just, again, a quick POC that we wrote in the last week. Um, but you could, you could pass in a burp file, a burp output file, and it will parse it and find um, any issues that are in that file, the severity, the confidence, the location, path, and host. You can look for less things in the file. You can look for more things in the file. Again, proof of concept. Um, we can expand from here. So it takes all of this information, and it pushes it to Elasticsearch, which again is a database. And then we built a Kibana dashboard to display that information. So in this case, we have three uh, burp scans. Uh, I think they're active scans. Um, it's actually the same file we just modified a couple times. So, you know, we cheated a little bit. But uh, um, just to give you, just to show you that you can create different types of charts in here, right? You can have base numbers, like what metrics are important to you. You can see them on the top. You can create pie charts with the severities and confidence levels and things like that. And you can have trending graphs that show you are my vulnerabilities going up and down and how do they look between applications and things like that. And these charts are super easy to create. This is, this is a graphical user interface where you check a box and say, show me this data, don't show me this data, or put a filter on data. Um, very easy to use. Um, so definitely recommend checking it out if you're looking to analyze any sort of information. Um, and presumably, it's able to, to, to um, handle a lot of information if you have a lot. Um, so to make this a little bit easier, um, and because I'm all about efficiency, um, I, I set up a project on GitHub that's a Vagrant project. So I have a Vagrant script out there. Um, so if you're anyone not familiar with Vagrant, you may just be embarrassed. But so Vagrant, Vagrant is, a, is an awesome tool that allows you to quickly spin up virtual machines um, that are described through a uh, configuration file, right? So I have a configuration file out there called a Vagrant file. Um, and if you install Vagrant and you install VirtualBox or VMware or, or something similar, um, then you're able to just type Vagrant up. And suddenly, you have this virtual machine will, will come up and running. And uh, it will install Docker for you. And it will go out to another GitHub repository and download uh, Docker containers, actually a Docker Compose set for, uh, for Elk. And it will set up Elk for you. Uh, hands off. So uh, pretty awesome. I'm real excited about this. I'm just starting to get into Docker, so uh, don't kill my buzz, because I know it's like <laughs> old news now. Um, but uh, it's really cool. So if you're interested in this, you could, you could, get, you could out, get out there and like try it out in you know, half an hour. You could easily, three minutes to grab the file, spin it up, and then just, you just sit there and wait. And then suddenly, you'll have this environment. You will have to write your own Logstash files, or you can grab the example one that I have, also on GitHub. Uh, and then you'll have to create your own Kibana dashboard. But as I described, that's really pretty easy. Yeah? So if you already have something that's Sumo logic, right, then I don't need to use uh, Kibana and Logstash, right? If you already, sorry. Sumo logic? I'm not familiar, sorry. It's also something like a dashboard and a log. So what is the function of it to display? Um, I think uh, in the previous company, uh, we had like one person working on this and finally figured out like it's more like, is it like the amount of time spent 
depend on him or coming up with a new tool to create it. So right. it's not like if you're going to open source, if you don't have money, then you need to go with this. But if you have enough money, then it's better to go with smaller. Right. So so that's fair. So there's a few considerations here. So first of all, Elk is free. So I'm using it from, from that standpoint as a you know, user, not as an enterprise. Um, so I, I'm not, no, no hands in here to say that this is better or worse than any other solution. If you have something that's working, then I, my, I'm certainly not saying you should change course. Um, my, my hypothesis here or my, my thesis here is that for most people, the tools that you're using are not giving you what you need. They're not generating the metrics that you want, and so you're either having to export those and mess with them in Excel, or you're not able to get them at all. Um, and so I'm just looking for other tools like this, and then I, I, SonarCube, and those, those are the next ones. These are some other tools that you can use that you can put data into, and you can get data out of uh, by either creating your own by creating your own dashboards. Yeah. What would that uh, GitHub location be? So if you, it's I think it's GitHub.com. It's probably slash Kevin Feely or Kate Feely. <laughs> Man, that hurts. Um, <laughs> It's, it, it go to, if you go to github.com slash Kevin Feely, all of my repos are there. There's only like 12 of them, so it should be pretty easy. Um, and it, the repo's probably called like Vagrant slash Elk Stack or something. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I'll, I'll put them all up at the end. Um, but does everyone here know what GitHub is? <laughs> Taking that for granted. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, all of them are except for Archer. But we're, so Archer is a commercial GRC tool, um, but we're, I'm starting to see more clients using it for to put every all of their issues in there and then using it for their full vulnerability management uh, system. But you can use Defect Dojo. There was a presentation about yesterday here. Uh, Simple Risk. Is are they are they the sponsors on our bags? Yeah. Oh, I was wondering what that is. I hadn't looked it up yet. Uh, Simple Risk. There you go. Yeah. Do you work for Simple Risk? No, I do not. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to check it out then because Archer is out of my price range. So, and I'm curious what, what else is out there. Uh, but these are just some examples. There are probably many more. But Threadfix, uh, uh, oh, Defect Dojo is an OWASP project. Th uh, Threadfix, there's, there's a community edition, which is, which is really good. Uh, I've mentioned it before. Dan Cornell spoke yesterday about it a little bit. Um, and there's more functionality to these tools than just creating dashboards, but they're all supposed to be able to take in data, vulnerability-related data, and display it in a meaningful way. Um, SonarCube isn't 100% a security-related tool, um, but some organizations, it's, it's pretty easy to use, um, and developers can interact with it, so it's, a, it's, a, it's another good start. And as far as I know, I think there's some plugins or something for SonarCube that are OWASP. There is. So there's... Yeah. So there's there's an o yeah. So there's there's an OWASP security project um, that's basically uh, it's not it's not a plugin, but they they tag uh, or there may be others that I'm not aware of. So the one I'm aware of is uh, they tag certain uh, security related findings as uh, OWASP issues, and they tag it with OWASP A1 or OWASP A2 or, or whatever the particular issue is. So one of the interesting things we did for a client, and I didn't want to put it in here because it's just the, doesn't look as interesting, um, but what, what I did was I took the, that information and I created a dashboard very simply um, that, uh, that just displays just the OWASP findings, just the, the OWASP related findings, because that does not exist as an OWASP project, to just display just the OWASP stuff. Uh, so I created a dashboard. They were interested in to, to see what their security issues are. Um, so this is essentially an OWASP dashboard. But that goes to say that like, you, can, you can customize these tools to show whatever information you want. As long as you can find a way to get the data in, then you can you know, manipulate them to get the data out in the way you want. And the same goes with Jenkins. You can create dashboards at the project level that shows you trending. Uh, it, just, you know, it consumes your artifacts that come out of your build. So if you have static analysis as part of your build, or dynamic analysis, or whatever you have, um, you can write a, uh, a Jenkins dashboard that will take that information and display it in a way that's meaningful to you. And there are plenty of these out there already on GitHub. Not that you know, I'm a big fan of GitHub, but um, there's, you could always look and see if these things exist already. You can extend them, you could fork them, um, and obviously I promote contributing back to them. Um, so, any other questions? I'm glad you guys are in, engaged. This is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
so the other, another issue is the reports for my tools suck. Um, and this is, uh, this is very common, um, right? So if you're using a tool like, uh, no, I don't want to name any names, but let's say you, you're, you're using a tool um, and you're not putting the results necessarily in a, in a centralized dashboard, but you just want to view the results um, in a way that is meaningful to the way that you do your job, right? That meets your workflow. Um, how can you do that? Uh, well, so we're going to use XPath again. So what I did was I took, that's an AppScan standard uh, output file, and I know I'm a little biased towards IBM. We're a partner, so we have licenses, and that's why it's a go-to tool for me to experiment with. Um, but no, no bias as far as that versus other tools. It's just that I have more access to it. Um, so uh, we took an AppScan standard output file, which is their dynamic analysis tool, um, and I used XPath to create the report on the right. And I'm going to show you what that looks like uh, here. Uh, let me move this over here. It'll be easier for me to bring it up. So this is XSLT. How many people are familiar with XSLT? Most. That's great. Okay, cool. I guess these, these are pretty old, older technologies. Uh, nothing really cutting edge here, but I think they're still relevant. So uh, I still get excited about them because they're powerful. So this is XSLT, and you can see it's, it's actually, there's a lot of HTML in here. There's some JavaScript. I point to some CSS files. Um, and I haven't really written like a UI in probably at least seven or eight years uh, in like HTML. So uh, the power of CSS and JavaScript today was just mind blowing to me when working with this. And I'm, I'm going to show you that. If you don't build UIs, you can. And it's really cool. So. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, so we have uh, this file. You can see it's just an, it's, it's, a, it's defined as an X, uh, XML file. Um, and you can see that there's HTML embedded. We point to some, uh, it's actually two JavaScript files for data tables. And I just did a Google search because I have this data from this, uh, uh, from this um, AppScan standard file. And it's in this is essentially a table, right? An HTML table. And I was like, what format can I put a, a data in a table? In that's like more useful than just having this uh, this big uh, big table. So uh, you'll see. So anyway, all I do I import those two things. I, I have this tiny JavaScript function um, that that calls it. I have a little bit of CSS, um, and then this is all HTML, which is again really simple. I'm assuming that everyone here is familiar at least a little bit with HTML. And I did use some inline styles. I don't know if that's still like faux pas. It was like 10 years ago. Um, but it was easier for me, so I did it. Um, and, then, and then we have some XSL. So this is where we really get to the meat of it here. So we have this XSL statement, very simple. We're going to select the value of summary totals. And this is really, we have uh, in, our, in our XML that we're looking at, we have an XML element called summary. And inside of that, we have an XSL, uh, XML element called total issues. Um, and so that's, that's as simple as this is. I'm saying, look in this issue, look in this element, then look in this element, um, and show me the value, put it here. Then we have a loop. You can see the loop is really simple. It's just that and this, and then we put whatever XSL we want in here. We're going to get the name, uh, total informational issues, total severity, uh, total low, total medium, total high, and then the totals. So we have this loop. I'm going to get to the HTML to show you. I'm just trying to demonstrate that this really isn't complex. And then this, this is the part that blew my mind. So this is really the, the meat of the CSS, is just this, these couple like little table definitions in, in here. Um, and you'll see if you're, again, if you're not like into CSS3, um, this may blow your mind too with how simple it was to create this awesome table. Um, and then we have a little more uh, XSL in here. It's pretty simple. And, we, and then we get to uh, the XPath. So it's just, you know, it's a couple lines. It's really not a lot. Most of this is just HTML. And then I will open it for you to show you, because you can't open it on my computer. So all right. So you can see we have the title up here. We have the total issues, right? And then if we had multiple hosts that we had scanned, that would all be listed here with the number of issues per host. Um, and then all of our issues. And so remember, I, I just had that CSS for the table. 
And it created all of this for me. It gave me this search box. It gave me this show how many entries in the table I want. That's dynamic, which is amazing. Um, I can filter uh, by search. I can and I can sort however I want. It shows me. And there are, if I go to the bottom, 4,631 issues in this file. And it, like, just blows my mind how easy it was to create this. So, sorry if I'm getting a little noobish here, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. So anyway, so again, just for a proof of concept, I just put some basic information here. But any information that's in the XML file, you can get out and display it here. So I just put you know, the severity, the CVSS score, the CWE, so I can easily just click here and it opens up MITRE, right? points to it, um, the issue type, and then the URL. So I could, like, I could easily imagine being on a security team and instead of giving you as either another member of my security team or as a developer or as my boss, instead of giving you a, like a 50 page PDF report, I understand there are some security issues with handing you an HTML file, five minutes, but, but, it, it, but it could, uh, you know, could make everyone's life a whole lot easier. It's easier for me to generate, we could work on it uh, really easily um, and it can be dynamic. So, and there, you know, there's no server here. It's just a flat HTML file. So um, awesome. Anyway, uh, any questions about that? Is everyone's mind blown? <laughs> All right. Yeah. You took the result, you analyzed it, and then you, like for example, removing all the false positives, and then you did this? Yeah so, yeah, so in this case, I didn't. I didn't do any analysis on the output file. But you could, right? You could do whatever triage you wanted. Um, or uh, you, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a whole separate workflow that I didn't take into account here. This is really just the reporting. It's taking the file with whatever it has in it, whether hopefully there are no false positives, right? Because tools are not going to give you any false positives ever. Um, or duplicates. Or duplicates, right, thank you, yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't really take that into account here. Here, here I just took the raw file um, and imported it. Yes. So that would be awesome, but then we're building our whole new application. And I wanted to try to avoid that. Um, <laughs> but yes, that would be great. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you to write it and open source it. Um, <laughs> so you can fork this and then do it. Um, so yeah, so uh, very easy to do and just get some much better visualizations, much easier ways to look at stuff. Um, and I was going to the code. Um, so create it if you, if you can. Um, then we have this, this one other one. I'm just going to sort of gloss over this because I don't have a lot of time. Um, but we had this other client who they were using AppScan standard for dynamic analysis. Um, and, uh, you know, these dynamic analysis tools are pretty good at finding uh, all of the pages in your application sometimes, depending on your architecture and stuff. So um, for this application, it was not doing a good job at crawling and finding it all. Um, but they had all of the data in Burp because their, their security team was already crawling their whole application. There's no way to export data from Burp and import it into AppScan standard and say, hey, look at all of these pages. Um, so we created it. And it's, it's like super easy. And this is, so this is on GitHub also. Um, it's just a, an extension for, for Burp where you just you know, click on what you want, click export, and it will give you an export file that you can import into AppScan standard um, for your crawling. So you don't have to do that. Um, you don't have to leave it to that. Make sense? So, so in this case, they were already doing like manual testing anyway as like a separate function, right? The, they had manual people testing the application. Or if you have QA, right, automatic, like testing the application, doing their QA tests, you have them just proxy it through Burp anyway, and then you have all of the requests behind it. The goal is to get it for free. So, but if you, if you leave it to the automated uh, um, crawler, then you're, you're probably not going to do a whole lot better than AppScan standard would do anyway. So, yeah. Um, so I'm not going to show you the code, but it's very easy. It's on GitHub. You can look. So if you're all on board, where do you begin? GitHub is the way to go. Um, all about it. I know that there are other like uh, you know source code management systems that are open source, but GitHub is my go-to because um, it's there's just so much out there. So you should not be starting to write any code on your own. Uh, just fork other projects. That's probably terrible advice in general. Um, but fork other projects um, and modify the code that's existing to to give you a good base. If you have an idea for something, give it a shot. It doesn't even have to be a good idea.
just it'll help you learn the APIs, figure things out, and then when you have a good idea, you're, you know, the barrier to entry is so much lower because you already know what you're doing. Um, uh, clone existing stuff, don't write your own parsers, use the existing ones. Um, there's some vendor documentation for some of these, uh, like Jenkins has pretty good documentation on how to write plugins, SonarCube not so much. But SonarCube has a mailing list that you can use to, to ask questions and get information back. Uh, there are dev forums and blog posts for this type of stuff. So just look at what's out there. Um, I'd be happy to, to talk to you too. Um, key takeaways, uh, you have the power to solve your own problems. It's probably easier than you think. These things are really not difficult, even if you're not a developer, even if you don't have a lot of coding experience. Um, don't start from scratch. XPath is beast mode. And contribute your stuff back to GitHub so that I can use it, um, and we can continue to advance together into being unicorns or something. I don't know. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's all. Thank you.